All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Udi Lettergore, who is up in the Bay Area. How are you doing, Udi? I'm doing great, John, coming to you live from San Francisco. Yeah, absolutely. And Udi is the CMO of Gong.io uh, and has a long track record in, in marketing leadership. And what we're going to talk about today is the ever troubling, ever fascinating subject of forecasting and why, why for says forecasting is broken. And why do we say it's broken? Well, because in a vast majority of organizations, you will find that their forecasting accuracy levels leave a lot to be desired. And the knock-on impact of that, well, you know, it depends on the business you're in, but it can be pretty catastrophic at times. Um, so let's get, let's get straight into it, Udi. From your experience, um, why is it that people struggle so badly with forecasting? Um, I mean, it's an age-old problem, and, and, a, and a lot of companies have almost kind of thrown in the towel on it. Yeah, I think forecasting has been considered for many years more of an art and craft than a science. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that, that, that has been common around different sales practices over the years. And in recent years, I think the, the winning sales leaders have discovered that there is a science along with the art and craft of sales and forecasting is no different. And if you look at all the manual labor, all the guesswork that goes into forecasting, all the interrogation that managers have to ask their people and then their managers ask their people, et cetera, there's so much work and yet we're left with this unsatisfying forecast more often than not, uh, there's gotta be a better way. Uh, no, absolutely. And a lot of forecasting just seems to focus on historicals, right? We just take historical data and kind of extrapolate from that. And as you say, throw in a healthy dose of gut feeling, mix it all up and say, well, it's kind of approximate forecast. Well, well the, the historicals are good when times are stable. There's a lot to learn from history, as, as any history buff will tell you. Uh, but the history goes out the window when we're living in in stable times like now or unstable times like now. Um, learning from what happened last quarter or last year is absolutely irrelevant to what's going on right now. And the better approach would be to reading the signals on a deal by deal basis, which is of course impossible to do at scale at a human level, but luckily we have machines and robots that can do that for us. And looking at what signals the deals are telling us for what's really going to close and what's not going to yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, and and as you said, like we have to have a way of actually being able to analyze those properly because uh, if we, again, if we down to gut instinct or I always call it happy years, you know, a lot of salespeople have happy years, you know, they hear what they want to hear and uh, uh, and put the best spin on it possible. So a lot of the, sometimes the signals can get very misinterpreted unless we're very clear in what they mean. Absolutely. Uh, there, there's happy ears, which are always going to happen, which is why we should take human judgment and opinion with a very large grain of salt. And then there's a problem with linearity that goes out the window. Uh, looking at historicals in unprecedented times just doesn't work, right? Uh, we saw this during COVID. Companies who were trying to continue their strategy that worked before COVID did not do very well during COVID because unprecedented times call for a different type of strategy. And we're seeing the same thing happen now. But luckily, there is hope. <laughs> there's always, there's always hope. So let's talk a little bit about how how you approach forecasting and and the the, the difference in the way you look at it. So so I think there's four key recommendations that that we would make for anyone trying to forecast at a time like this. Number one is to replace opinion with reality, mm. taking out the guesswork and the gut feelings that are probably ungrounded in times like this and should always be an input into the process, but should never lead the process, and replace those opinions with a healthy dose of reality. Reality is, is the, the word we coined at Gong to describe facts and data that affect your go-to-market strategy, that affect how you're going to win your market. So by looking at actual customer conversations, what are customers saying about their deals? And that rep with the happy ears, is she listening when the customer says, We've actually pushed this initiative into next year because of all the uncertainty in the economy. 
if that didn't register and and humans are all error prone i know mm -hmm. i am yeah. if that did not register then she's probably not forecasting this deal in the right quarter so that would be number one replacing opinions with reality Number two would be to replace a lot of the manual work that goes into the forecasting process with automated capture and insights. If we had an autonomous system that captured all customer conversations across emails and Zoom calls and telephone calls and text messages and did all this work for us, here's, here's a fun fact for you, John. You know, in a, in a one hour typical conversation with a customer, 6,000 words are exchanged, right? based on the average talking speed of, of humans, I speak faster than average human, but for average humans, they speak 6,000 words in an hour. Do you know what the average length of CRM notes is that the average salesperson puts in there? It's about 30 words. So that's like half a percent. So 99.5% of the information is lost even before it makes it to the CRM. And of course the rep is gonna put only what he or she deemed as important, missing out on a lot of vital information. So by autonomously capturing all these conversations and having them in one system, you're already 99% ahead of the rest of them. And then number three is consolidating all the different tools and all the different spreadsheets that companies use into a single tool, into that single source of truth. Sorry to repeat the cliche, because uh, mm -hmm. sales teams are still looking for that source of truth. It's definitely not your CRM, not your CRM with those 30 words describing 6,000 words that were actually exchanged in an hour. So replacing all those dif different tools, all those different spreadsheets, all those different conversations. So what's happening with the Acme account and what's up with that one? No, put it all into one tool that has all the conversations and adding that layer of reality beyond opinions. And finally, replacing the past with the present. And what I mean by that is what I said earlier about the linearity and historical models, simply not cutting it in unprecedented times that we're all getting used to living in right now. So all those four things can exist in a single platform that can help your team forecast better than they're doing with all the manual opinion-based processes so far. Yeah, and one, one of the other things I think that's, uh, that's quite fascinating is, is what you were just talking about here at the end is the, um, is the consolidation because we, have, we, we tend to get really hung up today on having so many data sources, so many imports. We love this idea of big data. But at the end of the day, it's not big data. It's meaningful data. And I always call it small data because it just always like to be contrarian. But it's, it's small data that matters at the end of the day. And figuring out which data points actually count as opposed to gathering all that you could. And we seem to be in, a, in an era now where people just get hung up on gathering as much stuff as possible. And all it is is noise at the end of the day. I, I agree on two fronts. One, uh, my, my CRO and, and good friend, Ryan Longfield, uh, he's known for saying, the last thing I need in my life is more data. Mm -hmm. And what he means by that is, yeah, we all have more data than we'll ever be able to dig through. He wants actionable insights. And so if your system is just collecting data, you might as well be collecting dust. You don't need more data. You need the right data at the right time with the right analysis and the right actionable insights. So that's number one. Number two, you talked about consolidation and we're seeing customers look for efficiencies at times like this when CFOs are squeezing their purses, trying to get more out of less resources. But the best sales leaders know that there's a time to save and there's a time to invest. And you wanna make sure that if you can't have all the tools out there, yes, you might have to consolidate, you have to ask yourself, what are the most important tools that are going to move the needles that are important to my business? And if that means that you need one really strong part, let's say it's revenue intelligence that we believe is, is a really crucial part to any, any business wanting to run, then maybe you can compromise on other pieces of software that are not as critical and have been commoditized. But going with the consolidation narrative to the extreme means that you might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater by consolidating and letting go of pieces of software that are really crucial for a business only to get a, a, a piece of software that's half as good because you're getting it thrown in for free. If you're getting something thrown in for free, we usually know what the value of that free product or service is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
Yes, we often come across people who come to us after experimenting with their uh, with their free offerings. Um, the other thing that's interesting as well, I do think that that there that we've also come through a period of there's so many point solutions out there, right? People just and with the web technologies, etc., it's become very very easy to create superficially what looks like an interesting uh, an interesting um, you know piece of software. But at the end of the day is it's become, and and I think it's also become too easy because of obviously of SaaS and all that, it's become too easy to implement a ton of different tools. And I think this has been done to the detriment. And I think if there's one thing coming out of this, a little bit of consolidation, maybe you're consolidating down to a, a few tools, but it's it's really looking at all those point solutions. Are they being used? Are they being used by everybody? Or does everybody have their own like tool set, which often ends up these days where people start supplementing themselves and you get things get a little chaotic? Yes, I, I think CFOs are, are doing the right thing by looking at usage and looking at value. But but usage can be confusing sometimes. Um, I'll give you an example. In finance, they have systems that they use for end of quarter or end of year reporting. So they're not going to see usage every day of the year because they only use them once once or twice a quarter. Does that mean they don't need those systems? Of course they need the systems. Um, if, if you have an emergency generator at home, are you going to judge its value by how many times a day you use it or by its availability for that once a year where you actually needed it? So usage can be confusing and, it, and it's not the, the end all of, of, of metrics that I would suggest that companies look at, but actually what is helping them drive the needle in the right way. And if there's a, a dashboard that they consult once a week or once a quarter that is helpful or something that reps are using to better themselves for better deal management and pipeline management, even if the CRO isn't going in every week, if it's providing that much value to the team, you might want to consider using it even if you don't see every single person using it every day. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I just think we've become through a, a period of where people just kind of like we're kids in candy stores because everything's like, oh, $20 a month, I'll add that. $20 a month, I'll add that. And and before you know it, you know, everybody's got their own tech stack um, running for them, um, which isn't ideal. Uh, one of the things also you mentioned is is automation. And I do think this is one of the things that maybe if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, maybe it has actually brought digital transformation, automation, and all of those to the fore in a way that pre-pandemic, it was being paid lip service. Some people were doing it, some people weren't. I think if the pandemic has taught people one thing, it's that if you're not if you're not um, migrating your digital processes, if you're not looking to automate rote and routine tasks, if you're not looking to um, use automation, as you mentioned earlier, to provide you with intelligent insights, you know, then you're going to get left behind pretty quickly. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that there's more than that. So there's two things that started happening in COVID and we're seeing them continue now. One of them is that search for more efficiencies. As companies were tightening the belt around the pandemic and now doing it again because of the current financial climate, um, definitely looking at tools that can provide automation and efficiency and faster insights to improve the team and get more out of less. That's definitely a trend that's going to continue. The second one is around the digital transformation that you also mentioned. I think before COVID, a lot of organizations were saying, yeah, we're going to use the next five to 10 years for our digital transformation. And then COVID came and they had to complete that transformation in three months instead of five to 10 years. And what we all learned during COVID is that a lot of things that we never imagined that could be done over a video call actually can. Our kids went to school over video, not ideal by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination, but they did. They actually learned a few things. Um, yoga classes were administered over Zoom. Uh, therapy was administered over Zoom. And guess what? Even salespeople who were selling six and seven figure deals that never imagined that they can do this from the comfort of their home selling over a camera. They are now doing that over a camera. They don't have to drive or, or fly to the other side of the world and wine and dine the customer for a day to get that deal signed. And CFOs and CEOs are not going back now. And so those field salespeople who many were resistant of all this technology because they're in the field all day and they're doing this Lone Ranger thing and they can't be bogged down by their CRM and other systems. They're now sitting at home in their sweatpants selling over Zoom and they now have access to all this technology and they're expected to use it to get just as proficient at what they're doing as the inside salespeople have been doing for a while. 
Yeah, and and the other part too is I think uh, that's also come out of this is is I think the thirst for human connection, human contact, you know, all, uh, lots of things like authenticity and all of that's been thrown around, and especially people are saying, "I'll show you how to be more authentic," and you go, "No, you get being more authentic is being more authentic." But uh, and I think that leads into what you mentioned about earlier is that people want to have conversations, people want to connect, people want to understand on a on a they want to be heard and they want to be acknowledged. Therefore. Once that's happening, then it's um, it's it's helping you because it's giving you that opportunity to have more deep, meaningful conversations where you're likely to uncover much more signals than you would um, if you were keeping this a little bit more at arm's length. A hundred percent. And I think one big trend that we've seen start in the pandemic is that many organizations who were never using video calls and video conferencing, they were either going out to the field or using a phone, audio only, mm -hmm they have now opened up and realized the value that's in video conferencing because this is probably the next best thing we can achieve compared to in-person conversations. And that's why therapists and teachers and salespeople have started using video calls in, in, in lieu of in-person meetings mm -hmm. because when I'm looking in your eyes, it's much harder for me to be multitasking and going through my Instagram. I'm not on Instagram, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, and, and seeing my my Facial expressions will tell you if you're being clear, if I am bored, if I'm surprised, if I'm agitated, and you can stop and change whatever you were going to say next based on my actual reactions. So the, this whole idea of video conferencing, to many of us, it seems completely obvious now, but a short three years ago, a huge part of the world was not using video conferencing. They're like, no, we, we just do phone calls and, and we're going to keep this sort of half private. And I think that's a huge mistake. And we've seen the data. Those who turn on their cameras are more likely to close the deal and keep the attention of the other side of the conversation compared to just an audio conversation. Yeah, it was it was a very, it was a bit of a strange phenomenon in its own way where you had uh, salespeople who were I mean they'd walk into any room, networking event, you know, but don't, you know they were really comfortable and being the life and soul and the center of attention. But then when you said switch on your camera on Zoom, they were like. Ooh. That's a little bit, uh, and, I, and it was funny that some of those people were actually the most reluctant to do it. Yes, I think you know part of it was people wanted to keep these artificial barriers between their personal life and their work life. And I, if I'm working out of my bedroom, I don't want people to see my laundry on my bed and all of that. So I think two things have happened. One, uh, folks like you and I have figured out a decent working environment, so we're not ashamed of the laundry piles anymore because they're in the next room. They're not in the room we're actually working in. And the rest of us have just accepted that letting people into our bedroom during a Zoom call is okay. And remember how reactions changed to children and pets running through the rooms when yep. we were on calls? In the early days, everyone was like, so, oh, I'm so sorry, so apologetic. And by month three, everyone was like, just bring the child in, let us chat with them, or what a cute dog that is, I've got one just like it. And I think that blend of work and personal life only does good for that authenticity and sincerity that you and I were talking about earlier. You can feel far more connected to someone after you've seen their laundry pile or their pet walk in on them in the middle of a work call. You're actually more likely to want to do business with them than someone that you only heard their voice on a, on a conference call. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point, and I think it uh, it really does sort of help with the peer to peer interaction because at the end of the day, you're kind of stripping away a lot of the extraneous, extraneous. things that maybe is look at somebody and go, oh, they're on such a higher level than I am, you know, therefore I'm going to take a subservient role in this conversation. I think it's it's helped with that people more confident to meet people, you know, on the same level because you're really all communicating through the same medium and you're slightly out of your environment. That That, that is true. And again, you, you see this uh, to this day when, when SDRs or BDRs make cold calls, they assume the other side is already angry at them and too busy to speak with them. <laughs> But if you get on a Zoom call, and so they talk really quickly and they, they apologize for barging in and calling unannounced and all that. If you're on a Zoom call, when, when you can do this, you see that the other side is usually very friendly and relaxed and willing to give you the time of day and just get through your, the, 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 the pitch that you came to give me. Um, and then, then the last thing on that, you know, for, for the same reasons that we talked about of being authentic and, and real, I never use a, a virtual or blurred background 
I want people to see my background, even before I had this beautiful office. Mm. I was working out of a basement with my kid's pet lizard for a year and a half during the pandemic. And even then, I never blurred my background. I wanted people to ask me about the lizard. I want people to ask me about the Muppets. I want them to assume that they're my children's. No, they're not. They're mine. And, and so I'm happy to talk about that. And that creates a real human connection. Yeah. How does the, uh, how does the lizard feel now that you've moved out? The lizard's fantastic. The lizard is upgraded. It doesn't have to listen to my boring calls all day. It now lives in the family room behind me. And, uh, and I will say that he won first prize for, for pet costume this weekend at our neighborhood pet parade. So we're very proud of it. Oh, well, that begs the question, what was the lizard wearing? He was he was wearing these dragon wings because the, the lizard type is a bearded dragon. So the only thing missing, he's got the beard, but he didn't have the wings. So we, we added a wings and a funny Halloween hat and he won first place for costumes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, you got to bring him next time. Absolutely. Uh, well, listen, Udi, this has been fantastic. All of Udi's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people more about you and Gong.io. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm happy to connect with our listeners uh, on LinkedIn. I'm the only Udi Littergore there, so you can't, you can't go wrong. You won't find another. And uh, if you do want to do reality-based forecasting and take your revenue team to the next level, you absolutely need to go to gong.io, check us out. And uh, we have a huge event coming up on November 15th. That's Celebrate Beyond. And we'll be showcasing a bunch of exciting product updates that we'd love to share with everyone. So thanks for listening this far and uh, hope to connect soon. Yeah, listen, great. Thanks again, Udi. And thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.